a portal could mean time travel, or you can go from one end of the universe to another, or even to an alternate realm. We're trying to push all of the frontiers we can. You know, people build these big, high-energy particle colliders. Something is missing. There's something wrong in our physics. We can't just look at our methods as, as the only problem. Could the neutron be disappearing into something invisible? You're listening to British Inn's podcast, where we take the ultimate sci-fi themes found in books and movies and discuss them with the world's leading scientists, engineers, and experts. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1. We've had a little bit of a break and we are back and we're talking about portals. I hope this episode is a nice distraction. It was great for me to edit this episode because there's a lot going on at the moment in the world and hopefully this takes you away from that a little bit. This week's podcast is brought to you by our sponsors and preferred retailers, Wordery and the Book Depository. And the book whose theme we're reflecting on this week is The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. It is one of my favourite books. It is so applicable to the topic on portals. In the story, some beautiful children go through a wardrobe, which is actually a portal into another land where they go on an adventure. The link to Chronicles of Narnia can be found in the show notes. My name is Amy Rose, and as a host of Wittigen's podcast, I bring to you an episode on portals with Dr. Leah Brassard. Now, in the series Stranger Things, the Upside Down World is a parallel world that exists amongst our own world, and in particle physics, a mirror universe could be hiding within our own universe, and it could be where dark matter is lurking. Now, Dr. Brassard, a particle physicist, has come up with a way to detect this mirror universe. Her thinking is that if this mirror universe actually does exist, then some particles, such as neutrons, could switch between our regular universe and the mirror universe. Let's have a listen. So this interest of yours, did it start when you were a child or was it something that just fell into your lap and you were like, wow, that's actually really interesting. I'm going to do this as a career. So how did it all happen? Yeah, it was always clear that I was going to be a scientist. <laughs> I'm very analytical to a fault. <laughs> I have to break down everything and, you know, it's... Are you not, not invited to parties and stuff? Oh, no, no. I mean, I, I would say I, I was very well-rounded as a child. Okay, you know, I was, good, good. I was a cheerleader. I did gymnastics. I twirled the flag in the marching band. I played the flute <gasps> poorly. But, you know, I think the real turning point for me was, was you know, definitely in high school. I had a physics teacher, Roland. In pots. And he actually, you know, he recognized that I was performing very well in, in class. And he managed to convince a professor at the local university to let me work in his laboratory, which was, you know, kind of unusual for the time, a high school student to work in the laboratory. Wow. Uh, but, you know, I would work there during the summer and I would go one or times, you know, a week during the school year, you know, volunteering. I did manage to get paid uh, at, at one point, but yeah, it was just, it's, it's really fascinating, exciting work. Now you're into portals, which is, I really like sharing these stories because it shows that literally you can become anything if you dedicate your life to it and put all your heart and soul into it. And let's talk about portals. How did you get into people up until recently were like, they don't exist. Well, I don't know. Maybe they were, but in books and stuff, they were just sci-fi sort of stories. So maybe I'll begin by explaining what is a portal. Yes, um, please. And in every day we see portals. A portal is just a door. We can take a door to go from one room to the next. In science fiction, depending on the author's imagination, a portal could mean time travel, or you can go from one end of the universe to another, or even to an alternate realm. In physics, a portal is referring to a specific kind of interaction between visible matter and this mysterious substance that we know must exist and what actually makes up most of our universe, which is what we call dark matter. I'm a neutron physicist. So neutrons are a subatomic particle. Protons and neutrons make up the nucleus of an atom. 
And neutrons are something we know how to describe actually very well with our model of physics. And it's something we can really easily come by or relatively easily come by in nature. So it's a very nice particle to use to study how well our fundamental physics models work. So that's, that's how this story begins. If you take the neutron out of an atom, it's actually unstable. It's the simplest type of atom, if you will, that's radioactive. It's actually the simplest example of something called radioactive beta decay. And it emits this beta particle, which is what we now know today is just an electron. And it also emits an antineutrino. So there's actually a lot of activity right now in studying how the neutron decays. Because it is so simple, it's much easier to understand than a big, complicated nucleus, and it's easy to describe. So it actually gives us one of the best tests of our understanding of the weak force in the standard model. So by trying to find a weak force, is that something that lots of other scientists are also trying to do? Is there difficulty in... Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of activity in this area. And why is that? I mean, like, what are other people doing with it and what are you aiming to do with it? You know, it, it comes back to the big question. So this is a good a good time to kind of step back and, and go to 10,000 feet and kind of look at uh, what we understand and what we don't. We understand the particles and interactions of nature actually extremely well. And we've been able to predict with great precision a lot of phenomena and a lot of particles and describe how processes like nuclear beta decay and neutron beta decay work very well. However, there are a lot of questions that are really puzzling and we just can't find the solutions to in our standard model. One of the big ones and very relevant to today's discussion is dark matter. Another one is why are we made of matter at all? Why, why haven't yeah. we all, you know, why isn't there equal amounts of antimatter and why aren't we annihilating? Why are we having a podcast? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we're trying to push all of the frontiers we can, you know, people build these big high energy particle colliders. Maybe if we have a lot of energy, we can create new particles. And people also perform very careful and precise measurements. Like in my field, maybe if we measure things very carefully, we'll see that our model actually breaks down eventually. It's a little bit flawed. We know it must be. The flaws are somewhere. So it's it's very exciting and interesting to wherever we can try to push boundaries in order to look for these signals. What's the new physics that we're missing? So that's why there's so much activity in this area. Yeah. So what I what I've seen is when someone comes up with something that everyone else thought was impossible, you become it, it sort of it adds another piece to the puzzle of the unknown. Well, it's how I was led there. You know, in my specific field of work, you don't really know what you're going to find. You know, you have to take another step to get to the question of finding new particles and dark matter. So for example, one of the ways that this this specific idea came up or you know, the way this specific idea came to my attention is this puzzle that we have in one of the measurements that we perform in my field, the neutron lifetime. How fast does the neutron actually undergo radioactive beta decay and turn into protons, electrons, and antineutrinos. But another approach uses cold neutrons. These have much more energy and they move extremely fast, 2,000 meters a second. So you create Ooh. a beam of cold yeah, you, you create a beam of cold neutrons, like a flashlight beam, and you measure how many protons are produced in a section of the beam compared to how many neutrons are going through it. If you compare those two methods, they don't agree. It actually appears as though neutrons are disappearing faster than they turn into protons and electrons and antineutrinos. We can't rule out something exotic is happening. I mean, th these are, we've been doing these kinds of measurements for some time. Something is missing. There's something wrong in our physics. We can't just look at our methods as, as the only problem. So people have started to ask the question, and this is how I became interested. Could the neutron be disappearing into something invisible? something dark. So are they disappearing into somewhere else? Into Is that what happened? Is that what we're talking about here when we're talking about portals? You know, you can ask the question, is the neutron in a sense going through a portal into this dark matter realm, if you mm -hmm. think of it that way? And that's where we get to this questions of, you know, a couple of years ago, I actually collaborated with uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory on a search for the neutron. Does it decay? What we want to do is actually try to see if neutrons could be undergoing an oscillation. And that is sort of the portal that it goes through in order to go into a dark matter state. And when you say dark matter state, because 
oh, and I'm going to bring up all the people who have written all these articles, what they say is you're trying to open a portal into a parallel universe. Is the parallel universe that that's actually the dark matter state? Is that? Yeah. I, and to be honest, that language surprised me a bit. I, you know, I, I think there was this pop culture hook in the, the release of, of Stranger Things. And, you know, the language is technically correct, but I think it is a little confusing to most people to, to hear it described that way. I think it was just too much for writers of clickbait headlines. <laughs> it was just too tempting. It actually, I bet. I mean, if it's technically correct, then it's going to sell some newspaper articles. So one of the things that I'm interested in is this oscillation process. So yes, are you trying to send matter through somewhere and then see where it goes? Is that what's actually happening? And how are you doing it? So an oscillation, it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So, you know, if you think about a, a particle's decay, a particle transforms into a heavy particle, into a lighter particle, and it's a one-way process. Oscillation is actually describing this transformation of the portal, or the, of the particle, sorry. <laughs> uh, a transformation of the particle. Yes, now I'm getting into it. Uh, it's describing the neutron transforming into a state that's, you know, if you want to use the word universe, I usually use the word sector. It's going from one sector to another sector. It's still, you know, when you think about dark matter, they're still particles. They're right here in our universe. They, they exist in the same time as we do. They feel the same gravity as we do, most notably. They just don't interact with us in any way. So that's kind of why, and especially when you have if dark matter is one particle, you usually don't refer to it as a universe. In this case, there are theories where dark matter is very rich, just as rich as our own matter, and it has its own particles and its own forces. And that's why we use the word universe to describe that entire set. So it's sort of coexisting with us, and we might even be able to weakly interact with it. So back to this question about oscillation, it's a multi-way process. So you can go back and forth you can transform back and forth between one state and the other state. And we see this. For example, one of the biggest discoveries in recent history was that neutrinos can oscillate. I was actually in high school at the time working in this <laughs> physics laboratory when it came out. Oh, man, I remember when the news came out. I was so <laughs> excited. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, physics, you know, even then, physics, fundamental physics anyway, seemed really old to me. You know, everything had already been discovered and there wasn't really much left to find. So it's just really just captured me when to hear that like something had completely turned our understanding of physics upside down. You know, I was a student on like a high school student on the other side of the planet and not at all part of this research, but I, I felt like I was part of history because I knew I was there. I remember where I was when I heard about neutrino oscillations. When everything's already been discovered, like this planet and everyone's already discovered all the countries, no one really explores as much anymore. So when you found out that someone had discovered something new, is that sort of what pushed you into the direction of and trying to discover more and, and understanding there's something missing? That's exactly it. If I weren't a physicist, I would be an explorer. I, I would, the most, probably the, in our deepest roots, that's who we are as humans. We're explorers. We, we must go to the frontiers of knowledge, the frontiers of our planet, the frontiers of space. We have to, yeah, this is, I can't imagine anything more exciting. <laughs> and this is what captured me early on. And still today, you know, it's okay. So oscillations, oscillations. It's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. It's like Schrodinger's cat. I think people are kind of familiar with this, just, just without the cruelty to animals. You can start with one flavor of neutrinos and there's three possible flavors. An oscillation just refers to how if you wait some time later, the neutrino will actually be in a superposition of different neutrino states. It'll be in a superposition of different neutrino flavors, just like the cat is eventually in this superposition of being alive and asleep. So if you measure it later, you don't actually know which neutrino flavor you'll get. And since you can't create or destroy charge, this only works for neutral particles. So why shouldn't it work with neutrons? Could neutrons oscillate into some neutral partner, even a oh. dark, invisible one? And yeah. so could that be what the, neutron the neutrons are disappearing into? One example is this mirror neutron, this identical twin of the neutron that people have hypothesized for you know more than 50 years. Could the neutron be just disappearing into its evil twin with a goatee, you know? <laughs> 
Is this is this where they got the idea when they wrote these articles that you were discovering a mirror universe or a parallel universe because you were you'd made a discovery? I think you know you have to be skeptical, and I, I would say I'm very skeptical of, of all of this. You know, I'm probably number one skeptical. But well, it's going to help you keep moving forward. It's, and I, I think it's important. And as an experimentalist, you know, your job is to destroy theories. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. the mirror universe, that's a real theory, and it's been around a long time. Uh, it actually comes from the weak force. It's, again, everything starts from the weak force. The weak force is really weird. It's left-handed. It only interacts with particles that are spinning sort of in a left-handed way compared to the direction they're moving. And that makes people really uncomfortable. And actually, we still don't understand why it's that way today. Why should the universe care about left-handed or right-handed? Yeah. Um, and so the idea was, well, maybe we can fix the universe let's just say there's a second copy of everything, except in this second copy, in this second mirror universe, everything is right-handed. And the two just don't interact with each other. And then we realized, well, that might describe dark matter. And so that's where this, oh. this idea originally came from. So the mysterious dark matters, just to confirm, like the, that's the neutrons that disappeared? So all we know about it is from gravitational observations. We really don't know what its particle nature is. And there's some, some very popular candidates that we've been searching for for a long time. So we're starting to be a little more creative and look a little more broadly. And it could be possibly that what the neutrons are disappearing into is what is actually making up dark matter or part of it. If they are disappearing into the dark matter, how on earth are you going to be able to even know that if they're disappearing to there? I mean, that's, that's a great question. So people have actually have, you know, about a decade ago, people started to try to look for disappearing neutrons. The first way people tried to look was using these very low energy ultra cool neutrons. You can trap them. And so they would just basically try to measure the rate they would disappear. And they would do that by changing the magnetic field and seeing if that rate that they disappear changes. Magnetic fields very slightly change the energy state of neutrons. And so that mm. changes the probability that you'd be in one energy state or another when you oscillate later on. And so most experiments didn't see anything, but actually one saw something very confusing or an anomalous signal, as we'll say. But the community didn't really react to this because of the question you actually asked, how can you be sure that neutrons aren't just disappearing? How do you know they're turning into a dark matter state like mere neutrons? So to address that question is actually uses cold neutrons and it's it's the kind of approach we want to use. Instead of using ultra cold neutrons, use cold neutrons where you have much, 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 much more, many orders of magnitude more. It's much easier to make cold neutrons than it is ultra cold neutrons. And so if you have lots of cold neutrons, you can do something rare twice. You can make the neutrons disappear and reappear. So that's the trick. They'll stand, they'll stand the test of time. So, And then you'll be able to know where they went. You have the proof. Well, the, the way it works is you create a lot of neutrons and you use magnetic fields to create a mechanism for them to disappear and reappear. And so that's why we make a wall. The wall stops all of the neutrons, the regular neutrons, but if any neutrons disappear before they hit the wall, they'll turn into dark matter and ignore the wall. And if they turn back into neutrons on the other side of the wall, they can be detected. And so that's the importance of this wall and this double signal. It has to disappear and reappear and only do it under the specific configuration of magnetic fields and only do it, you know, when there's a lot of ways to make neutrons appear in a detector. So you have to be very careful that you are, you're not getting just neutrons from space or neutrons from other instruments in your, your facility or from just neutrons that just go through the wall, which some of them actually do. So you have to measure everything very carefully. So the neutrons, neutrons are, are solid though. Yeah. And they go through the wall. So we okay. estimate that only about 1 in 10 to the 12, so that's a 1 followed by 12 zeros, only one neutron out of that many should go through the wall. And so okay. we can measure that. We measure that by just without a magnetic field. Do any neutrons get through the wall? Nope. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> okay so here's another one. So it's, it's common knowledge then that these neutrons are able to get through to the other side of the wall? 
Mm, no. There are mechanisms by which you can detect a neutron on the other side of the wall. A neutron could just happen to not get captured, and that's rare, but it can happen. Neutrons can bounce and scatter and interact with other materials and just go around the wall. Neutrons are, you know, you, you have uh, cosmic rays from space are constantly bombarding the Earth, and sometimes those create neutrons when they interact with matter, and so we have neutrons showering down from above us. So we actually have oh some... God. We have some constant rate, you know, a very low, but a, a constant rate of neutrons. And we have to understand how many are we getting and how, how much is that rate changing. And so we have to be a little careful about the timing of our measurements and being very careful to understand, you know, most of the measurement is understanding those backgrounds, those sources of background. So interesting. There are a lot of just really interesting problems you have to solve. It's really fun, actually. Yeah, and it would take forever. I mean, not for you probably, but for me, I'd spend a <laughs> lifetime trying to figure this out. So do you think that it is possible to have a parallel universe? <laughs> I, I I actually, I'm a firm skeptic. I think I would be astounded. It would take me a really long time to believe if I saw a signal. It's really fun and it's, it's but it just sounds so far-fetched. You know, the first time I heard about this, I'm like, okay, that sounds like science fiction, but it's, it's exciting anyway. I, I think it's important that we do the research because I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> My entire business is about proving our model of physics is wrong. So I have to look here. Wow. We have the neutrons. We have so many neutrons. We have to. We must. We're obliged. There's not many other people like doing this. So yes, I think you do have to explore it. Just it's your duty of care to the world. Not many people have fantastic neutron facilities in their backyard either. <laughs> I mean, no, you do have to be in the right, right place to, to do this kind of work. So if something, some sort of scientific proof came back that, you know, another universe, a parallel universe existed, is that what you mean by a signal? The implications are possibly that a parallel universe exists. This, what I mean by signal, um, and so that's that's a little bit of jargon, we use a detector to, to count all of these neutrons. So every time a neutron hits our detector, we, we get a little a counter on our, our TV, our, our monitor increments by one. And so we get some very low rate of neutrons that are just counting from neutrons from space and you know neutrons from the facility bouncing around and so forth. And we shield those very, very well, but we still get a few. If we see that number grow under specific configurations of our setup that are designed to enhance the probability of an oscillation, that's what I mean by signal. It's the sudden increase in the number of neutrons that are appearing, which must be coming through the wall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, as a skeptic, and I think every experimentalist has to be a skeptic, your first impulse is, okay, what did we do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I think if we can't if we can't come up with another solution, if there's you know some weird glitch in our system or some background that we didn't expect, the next step is to contact. Uh, there are you know people can do this with ultra cold neutrons, which is a completely different technique. You can bottle neutrons. We have to you know we shine neutrons like they're a flashlight, but you can actually capture and, and treat neutrons as bouncy little particles if you can get them low enough. So there you have a completely different technique, and they should be able to see a signal you know, this sudden increase in the no number of neutrons that are disappearing under the same conditions. And, oh and my then God. We would and are you able to do that? That's how we would approach it. That would be the boring and professional the and, the, and the very cautious and careful next step. If we were to see a signal, which, you know, I don't expect, okay. I'm, I'm searching, I'm investing my time. I think it's worth that much. And it's very, very exciting. But, but, we proceed with an abundance of caution. Well, yeah, and you should because if something does exist, if a parallel universe did exist, I think it's I think it's a Carl Sagan quote: "Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence." And this would it again, just like little high school Leah, you know, sitting in her classroom. I would be astounded to see physics yet again turn on upside down on top of his head. That's the how dramatic this would be. I feel like the you know I've spoken to a lot of scientists and they're saying that there likely is a piece missing. Yes. Because there's so much evidence of you know stuff happening and they can't explain it and so there there's, there must be something so someone eventually I think will turn physics on its head. I think 
that's what I keep coming back to. Everything sounds, you know, all of these dark matter searches kind of sound crazy, but we know it must be there. Something crazy is happening somewhere. Some, something really dramatic. We have to look. It's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and so, but you're dedicating a lot of your good years. <laughs> oh, it's, to, to this, I, I'll say the the majority the of my time is is working in neutron radioactive beta decay. That's that that is still the biggest chunk of my time. But you know, I am devoting a significant chunk of my time to this this project. It's not small. Are you saying to get to the next step and get the cold neutrons and see if they bounce around and? But you can only do that once you get the signal. Is you can't just do it now? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we we're already performing the measurements. Yeah. yeah. So so this is you know we expect this is if it exists it must be rare. So we've actually we've performed some first measurements. We've proved that we can perform the experiment and that we're not going to run into any crazy showstoppers. And I think we can even uh, you know I I can't I can't comment too much because it's. You want a complete analysis before you, you announce anything, but I expect we should be able to actually put out, you know, an actual, it's, it's very strange to have, you know, so much publicity before we have the paper out, <laughs> but that, we should hope to have one out pretty soon. I hate to say this, but if anyone's going to find this mirror world, it's probably going to be you because you've got everything at your fingertips to so be prepared. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would even hope for that. Exactly. Because if you think it's bad now with all the newspapers oh, and podcasts uh, and yeah, it'll you, be you'll, so much. I yeah. would go into hiding and then the newspapers would start to report that Leah disappeared into the parallel universe. <laughs> It's so that's do you know that is exactly what they would say <laughs> oh my gosh oh. anyway i've got really high hopes that you're going to be incredibly surprised by what you find but that's because i'm not a scientist <laughs> <laughs> well i just hope we do excellent research and we can say something definitive at least so i've got one more question okay so the last question is one that i ask everybody if you were to go back or forward in time, what sort of technology do you think would shock us? What do you think is going to exist um, that we can't think of? You know, this equation's a lot of fun. And, uh, or sorry, this equation. Listen to me. <laughs> this question. <laughs> no, no. This question's a lot of fun because you you can really you know go wild with your imagination. But I'm going to go against the grain personally. Ooh. I hope technology does more to help us escape from technology. So I hope we put away our phones, disconnect from our virtual social networks, and rediscover our love of nature and the great outdoors. So that's what I hope to see in 50 years. We are explorers, and we have a lot of amazing you know, national parks and, and just a wonderful, wonderful planet. And I hope we, we take great advantage of that. Oh, my God, Leah, so do I. I just don't have that high hopes for humans at the moment. <laughs> They're not really shaping up to be the best people we can no, we have, hope for. You have to hope. We have great potential. I think that we are going to, to come through. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And hopefully, perhaps, it's these big scientific discoveries which make us feel like, oh, we're not actually that important. Maybe we should look after what we've got down here because there's way bigger. Yes, we're, we are important. We're very important. And I, you know, I, I love the outdoors. It's and I find that's true of a lot of physicists actually. I think if when you're this deep in technology, you really realize how important what we have is. Leah, thank you so much for talking with me today. I learned a lot and I'm going to have to reabsorb and re listen to this <laughs> at least four times. Thank you so much for joining me for the first episode of season two. This whole season is about time travel and making our way through time and space in various ways using the science that we already have and the predictive tools that we already have at our fingertips. And these things, they seem so far away, but as we know and as we've seen over the past couple of months, these things, they creeping up really, really fast and technology is moving very, very fast. So I hope that this episode brought some respite to the things that are going on in the world and opened up your imagination to some of the things that we can expect please like and subscribe and stay tuned and please stay safe and stay healthy